Should nothing of our effort stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord builds up the house in vain, its builders strive. To you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me what is your life, a mist that vanishes a dawn. steadfast light and we shall let his people be all glory be to Christ all glory be to Christ our King all glory be to Christ his rule and reign will ever sing sing all oh, glory be to
Good morning. Welcome to our 11 a.m. service from Roskine Free Church. My name is Ian Morrison. I'm the ministry assistant here at Roskine, and I'm leading the sermon this morning. We're here to worship God, of course, and it's wonderful to have you join us online for that. And we'll begin by singing the well-known psalm, Psalm 100. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Please do sing along with us. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let's bow our heads and unite our hearts and let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence early in the morning on the first day of the week, we give you thanks and we give you praise that we can do this. We give you thanks and we give you praise that you are the one who enables us to do this because of what your son Jesus has done for us at the cross at Calvary. We praise you that your word tells us that he did not count equality with God something to be grasped, something to be held on to at all costs. But he made himself nothing by taking the form of a servant. He came into the world of men as a helpless babe. He followed a path of suffering and humility and humiliation. From Bethlehem's stable to Calvary's cross. And every step that he took, Lord, was a downward one. As he went lower and lower and lower until he reached the point on the cross where he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? As we gather, both in church 
and around your word online. We ask, Lord, that we would, each of us who hear your word today, that we would, each of us, realize that the answer to the question that Jesus screamed on the cross is us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whosoever believed in him would not perish but would have eternal life. We thank you for that, Lord, that we are the answer to that cry of anguish. We are the focus of the, 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 the search and the rescue mission that Christ came on into this world. And that we, Lord, if we believe and trust, you will take us to be with yourself. We thank you for that, Lord, because we cannot save ourselves. We cannot do this for ourselves. You alone, Lord, are worthy. You are alone, Lord, are powerful. You alone, Lord, are able to save to the uttermost through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. That Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe our sins had left crimson stains. He washed them. And he can wash them. And he still washes them. White as snow. Help us, Lord, to take hold of that as our hope. Our eternal, everlasting hope that is focused on Jesus. We come before you as, as ordinary people this morning. Human beings. And we come with our struggles. We come with our difficulties. We come with our burdens, we come with our infirmities, our weaknesses, we come with our temptations, and we come taking comfort that Jesus knows what our lives are like, that Jesus understands the joys, the sorrows, the temptations, the burdens, the struggles. Because he's experienced it all. He's been through it all. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Because he experienced it all, yet without sin. And as he deals with us and intercedes for us, all of that human experience, all of that human emotion, is at his disposal. Lord, we thank you for that. For no other could have done what he did. No other can do what he does. And no other will do what he will do in that he will come again and he will take those who love him to be with himself where he is. We praise you for that, Lord. Help us not to forget that. We remember, Lord, those amongst us who are struggling, who are suffering, who are bereaved, who are grieving and mourning over the loss of loved ones. We remember especially the Robertson family spread across the world at this time. But we also remember those who, during the past year, 18 months of COVID and pandemic and lockdown have been have lost loved ones as well. We remember them too. And we bear them up to you. We lift them up to you because you alone can heal. You alone can protect. We remember those who are struggling, those who are ill, those who are recovering from operations and from procedures, those who are still undergoing these things and are still under treatment. Those for whom the future seems short. We bring them to you, Lord, and we leave them on your care. And we, the best that we can do is to point them to you, to be signposts, to show them to you, to point them to you, to show you to them. That is the greatest comfort that we can bring our fellow human beings. And for those who die in Jesus, who fall asleep in Jesus. 
when they awake, they will see your face. And that will be enough for them. So all who mourn and struggle, we commit them to you. But we also remember those who rejoice. Your word tells us to mourn with those who mourn, but to rejoice with those who rejoice. We give thanks for the wedding in in New Zealand of of David McKeever and his his uh, fiancée Kay. We give thanks for this for this truly joyous occasion and we ask your blessing on them that you would stand with them and that you would lead them and guide them in the years that lie ahead and that they would know lord that you are the one who who guides and directs you are their head and you are the one who holds them remember the mckeever family here who because of Murdo and Kate and, and family who, because of, of the regulations and the difficulties in place at the moment, were not able to be present for this day. But we give thanks for the technology that enables us to meet and to greet and to, to celebrate across many thousands of miles. And we give you thanks, Lord, that at this time, that we are able to do these things. So bless the McKeever family as they look ahead, as they move forward. And we look for your blessing, Lord. We look for your feeding here this morning from your word. We look to see your care and your consideration and your compassion for those who are ordinary human beings struggling as we are. And we know, Lord, that where you have made a promise, you will honor that promise and you will keep it. So bless us, Lord, as as we come before you. Remember our minister, remember Callum and his family on vacation, on holiday at the moment, that, that batteries would be recharged, that he would be that he would be rested, and when he returns next week, that he would be ready to take up the yoke again and to serve you dear. Lord, that we would see souls for our hire in this place. This isn't for money. This isn't for wealth. This isn't for fame. This is to see your name lifted up so that you will have the glory. And we ask that that would be the case. And all that we ask is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ and in his name. Amen. Please join with me as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Well, good morning, boys and girls. How are you doing? How are the holidays going? Are you enjoying it? Or are you playing too much football? Spending too much time at the beach, too much time in the sun, too much too much time playing games. You're missing school. You want back to school. No? Good. Good. Just keep the factor 50 on so you don't get too sunburned. I've got something with me today. I've got a bag. In fact, I've got my bag. Look. See? You can see it. It's my bag. It's got Morrison's on it. It's got to be mine. Nobody else's from nowhere else. It's got to be mine. Yeah. I know Callum has a bag with Honda on it, so why why can't I have one? You know what to do when you see me or Callum with a bag. You know what to do, don't you? You know what to shout out. No, no, not whisper. Shout. Still can't hear you. Let's do it one more time. I'll count you down. One, two, three, Excellent. 
What's in the bag? Well, let's have a look and see what's in the bag. Well, this is what's in the bag. Doesn't look like much, does it? Doesn't look like much. We're just having something quick to eat, and we maybe want to go and watch football on the telly, and we go through into into the lounge. Then maybe you'll have this as your nap. That would be all you need, so that you don't make a mess all over the place, all over your sense. That's the kind of napkin that you would have there. Or if we're just sitting in the kitchen. And we're just going to wipe up afterwards, and you have this, which is not as nice as you expect from that, and not as big as the, as the, the tea towel there, but does the job. One sheet does plenty. Now, there's a story in the Bible about a napkin. And the Bible story is in, in, in the Gospel of John. And we're told that Peter and the other disciple, Peter and John, went to the grave, to Jesus' grave. And they were both running, but John ran faster than Peter. And he got there first. And he stooped and he looked in and he saw the grave clothes lying. But he didn't go in. He waited outside. And Peter arrived and he went inside and he saw the grave clothes, the linen strips lying there. And he also saw the napkin which had covered Jesus' head was folded up and was lying apart from the other wrappings. And then the disciple who reached the tomb first, John, also went in. And he saw and he believed because they hadn't until that point understood the scriptures that said Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now, why would the Bible mention the napkin. Well, apparently, in Bible times, when people were sitting and having a meal, they always used napkins. And if you were finished with your meal, if you were done with the food on the table, and to, to show the servants that, that they could come and, and tidy up, then and just the table. It was ready. It was ready just to be cleaned up. But if you took your napkin and you folded it carefully and you set it down by itself, folded neatly on one side, that showed the servants. That you had only stepped away from the table for a few minutes. You would be coming back. That's what the folded napkin in Jesus' tomb showed. That he was coming back. That he wouldn't be away for long. That he was coming back. Jesus keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. God promised in Genesis 3 that somebody would come and would deal with sin, would crush the serpent's head, and that was Jesus. And Jesus came, and he came and he said that, that he had come to give his life as a ransom for many, to save many, and he did that at the cross. And he's going to come again. That's the one promise that he still has to fulfill and he will fulfill it. He is coming again. So whenever you 
use or you see a napkin. Remember Jesus' promise. He's only stepped away for a short time. He is coming again. Thanks very much for listening to us. We're now going to read from Matthew's Gospel. We're continuing our studies in Matthew's Gospel. We're going to read from the end of chapter 9 and into chapter 10. Let's hear God's word together. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, reading from verse 35 through into chapter 10, verse 15. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go, rather, to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust from off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Over recent years, over the last five, six, seven years or so, research has been carried out in Scotland regarding the life of the church in Scotland. And this research has shown that less than 2% of the population regularly do what we are doing right now on a Sunday morning. Less than 2% of the Scottish population regularly worship God. That's quite startling when you think about it. Scotland is the land of John Knox. Scotland was once known as the land of the book. The land of God's book. And now most of the people that we meet in the street that we pass on the road, that we sit beside on buses and trains, that we work with, that we play with, that we go to school with, it means they're lost. They're unreached. They're untouched by the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ means nothing to them, or at least very, very little. Why is that? Why is that? Jesus here in, in Matthew 9, at the end of Matthew 9, he says the harvest is plentiful. He says there's people to reach, there's souls to be saved, there's work to do. But do we see this work as important work, those of us who believe and trust in Jesus? Do we see it as our mission? Do other things come before reaching the lost with God's word? Do other things stand in the way? Our own personal ambitions and hopes and dreams, do they stand in the way? Are they more important than spreading the word of God, the good news? If so, why is that? Why is that? 
Jesus here in, in chapter 9. He looks at the crowds and as he does so, he's, he's moved deeply with compassion. He's moved to the depths of his being. The Greek word used is splanknitsomai. And from that, we get our word for spleen. Splankna is the, is, the, is the Greek word for spleen. It's for the guts. It's for the innermost parts. Splanknitsomai actually means to be moved to the depths of your entrails. That's how deep an emotion this is. So when Jesus saw needy people around him, when he saw needy people coming to him, when he saw them in their need, he was moved to the very depths of his guts for them. He couldn't have been moved more. He felt so much compassion for them that it hurt. That it hurt. Let's just let that sink in for a moment. Matthew is keen to present Jesus as the king. The king promised, the king come. So Jesus, the son of God, Jesus, the promised king, he feels the deepest, innermost pain over ordinary people's struggles, over ordinary people's situation. He saw their need as they were around him and coming to them. He saw them as they were, And he wants us to see people struggling. He wants us to see them just like he did. He wants us to see people just like he does. He wants us, if we believe in Jesus Christ, to be moved in our guts deeply like he was. What he's saying is, he wants us to see the harvest The plentiful harvest, just like he does. He wants us to see it through his eyes. Look at the pity that's shown in verse 36. Jesus saw people who were struggling, people who were harassed, people who were burdened, people who were helpless, burdened by their sins, spurned and scorned by their religious leaders. Last week we saw the question that the the Pharisees asked the disciples. Why is your teacher eating with sinners? He saw people who were wandering aimlessly through life. No direction, no destination, no shepherd for their souls. Nobody to bring them to him. He saw a people who were hopelessly and utterly lost. We need to see people, ordinary people, everyday people, all people. We need to see them like Jesus did. There's a family. They seem happy. They've got good jobs. They've got plenty of money. They've got a nice house, a good car. They change it every two years. Maybe they've got a, a second car too. Summer holidays, as and when they like. They've got everything that this world has to offer. There's plenty of people living around here like that. People on our streets. People we know. People we're related to. And they look like they've got it all sorted. But maybe if you could take a look inside their hearts... You'd maybe see turmoil. You'd see fear that they might lose it all. You'd see loneliness. You'd see desperation in case disaster comes. No answer to their questions. What's the meaning of life? These people need Jesus. They need the king. They need a shepherd for their souls. Here's another family. And maybe, maybe they're not as well off. They've, they've, they've got a house. They've got somewhere to stay. But, but their lives are marked by addiction, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is. And to look at, they seem hard. They seem antagonistic, anti-gospel, anti-anybody who tries to tell them about Jesus, that there's a better way. But if you could peer into their souls. 
maybe you'd get a surprise. Maybe you'd see people who, who are afraid of death, afraid of dying, but who are more afraid of life, who are more afraid of living, who have no hope, who need someone to see them as they really are and, 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 and to still love them. They need a, a shepherd for their souls. They need somebody to reach them for Jesus. How will they hear if nobody, if nobody tells them? Jesus saw the ultimate destination for all of these people who were living their lives aimlessly, hopelessly, without a shepherd for their souls. He saw their ultimate destination, which is the same as all of us, any of us who don't have Jesus as the shepherd of our souls. And that destination is hell. That's what we need to understand about our friends, about our neighbors, and about our families if they haven't got Jesus. It may seem like they've got it all worked out. It may seem like they've all got it together. But if, 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 if they don't know Jesus, if they're not saved, they need God's grace. They need a shepherd for their souls. Can you see them, these people? Can you see them as Jesus sees them? Can you see them as they really are? Not as they seem to be. Not as the, the, the mask that they put on tries to tell everybody how they are, but as they really are. He knows, Jesus knows their condition, but he still loves them. He still wants them to come to him. Nobody, nobody, nobody is beyond the pale. He is able to save to the uttermost. Lord Jesus, this morning, help us, help us see this harvest through your eyes. So Jesus had pity. And he saw a plentiful harvest. Look at verse 37. He saw people needing service. A, high, a harvest ripe for the picking. He saw people to be delivered, to be changed, to be saved. He saw souls to be won for him. He didn't see problems. He saw potential. He saw potential. What do we see in the people living around us? Do we see sinners lost in their filthiness and vileness? People who should know better. People who should behave better. People, we think, who are living like animals who just don't care. Is that what we see? Or do we see them as somebody that Jesus could take and make so much of if they came to him? See, that's Jesus' view of lost men and women. He sees them not as they are, not as they... As, he sees them as they could be. He sees the potential. He sees souls to be won. He sees sinners to be saved. Because that's what he saw in us. That's what he did for us. We need that same vision. If we're going to reach people today, if we are going to be the instruments in the Redeemer's hands here in this part of the world and your part of the world, wherever you're watching from, we need to have Jesus' vision of the streets and the schemes and the roads and the houses and the workshops and the schools as harvest fields ripe, ready for the picking. Samaritans were despised in Jesus' day. The Jews were antagonistic towards them. They despised them. Once, Jesus and his men were, were at a, a Samaritan city, and Jesus went and spoke to a Samaritan woman who was sitting by the well. He didn't see her as a Samaritan. He didn't see her as somebody to be despised. 
He didn't see her as a, as a, as a woman who, 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 who had had five husbands and, and was living with a man who wasn't her husband. He didn't see these things, and he certainly didn't see them as an impediment, as a barrier to going to her. He saw her as what she could be through his grace and with his mercy. And so he saved her. And because he saved that woman, other Samaritans were also saved and also believed in Jesus Christ when she went back into the city and she said, come, see a man who told me everything that I did. Is not this the Christ? Isn't this God's anointed? Isn't this the king that God has sent? Jesus saw the harvest not just in one place, but he saw it everywhere. And he saw it as plentiful. People need Jesus. People need to be saved. People need him as the shepherd of their souls. The harvest really is plentiful. The harvest really is ripe for the picking. We need to see it, but we need to do more than see see it. We need to do something about it. We need to be willing to be the the instruments in the Redeemer's hands to bring these people, to point these people to him. God, help us to see this harvest through his loving eyes. He did see one problem. He did see one problem. He saw potential, great potential, but he saw one problem. And that problem was too few laborers. Too few laborers. And that's a problem that still exists. That's a problem that we're still facing today. Thinking of our own denomination in Scotland, the Free Church of Scotland. The Free Church of Scotland needs, over the next 10 years, will need something like 70 70 ministers simply to stand still. Too few laborers. Too few laborers. Harvesting is hard work. Ask any farmer, even with machinery, even with even with modern methods, harvesting is still hard work. And it seems that, that few are really willing to roll up their sleeves. And, and, and to get involved. The harvest can't. The harvest won't gather itself. Wouldn't it be nice if, if our potatoes or our carrots, if they dug themselves up, cleaned themselves down, and then piled themselves into nice bags and, and got themselves into our cupboards? Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that, does it? We have to get out there. Men have to get out there. Women have to get out there and do the work of harvesting. To harvest, you need to go where the harvest is. You need to be where the fields are ripe. If we just sit in church, we won't see a harvest. We need to go where lost men and women, struggling men and women are. We need to put ourselves at the disposal of the king. We serve at his behest. He is our king. We are his servants, all of us who believe in Jesus Christ. And the harvest, the harvest is hard work. But without it, without hard work, We won't see the harvest brought in. We won't be the redeemers, the the instruments in the redeemer's hands. People around us, people we work with, people we work for, people who work for us, people who are related to us, people whom we love, people who we're not so keen on, they're struggling. They're all struggling. They're looking for meaning. 
They're looking for substance in their lives. They know that they were meant for something better. Surely, surely, as God's people, surely we care. Surely we want to see these people we care about saved. We need to do more than just want it. We need to see the harvest through Jesus' eyes. We need to be willing to go into that harvest for Jesus' sake. The church, the church in all of its forms, in all of its denominations, the church who believes in the, in, in the crucified, risen Lord Jesus Christ who's coming again, the church is God's plan to evangelize the world, to save the world, to reach the world with the good news of the gospel that he has come so that people who would believe in him would be saved and wouldn't perish. He's come with forgiveness. It's freely available. That's God's plan, is to use the church for that. How are we doing? How are you doing? How am I doing? Ter- not terribly well, truth be told. That's the problem. That's the problem. How can people be saved if nobody tells them where the forgiveness is available? Look at verse 38. This is, this is a word about power. Verse 38. Jesus told his men, Jesus told his disciples what was the first thing that they needed to do regarding this harvest. Roll their sleeves up and go out and do it? No. The first thing is to pray. Is to pray. Before we go, we pray. Why not go first, then pray? Why pray first and not go? Why? Because actually, getting the harvest brought in, preparing the ground germinating the seed, watering the seed of the gospel, that is actually God's work. All we can do is carry the seed to the people. He prepares hearts. And if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus today, that's what he did with you. He prepared your heart to receive and to welcome the good news of Jesus Christ. And he watered it in your heart so that it would grow. If he doesn't do that, there's no, sir, there's no harvest. Because the harvest, being saved, me being saved, you being saved, the harvest, it's a miracle of God. It's a miracle of God. It's the same power that saves souls as raised Jesus for the, from the dead. It's the same power that takes us as we are and turns us into followers of Jesus. It's the same power that lifts us out of the lost line of Adam and puts him into the saved line of Christ. It's God at work in human hearts. Only he can do that. I can't save anybody. Nobody can save anybody else. All we can do is point to Jesus. Only he can save. What we do, our first task, is to pray over the harvest. Jesus told them to pray for God to send laborers into the harvest. If we pray as we should, as we must, God will work within us. If we come to God, he will come to us. If we come to him in prayer, he will come to us. And he'll work in us to compel us to work for the harvest. It's like Isaiah in chapter 6 when he looks around and, 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 and who will go for us? Who will we send is the question asked. 
And Isaiah looks around and nobody else will go and, 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 and he says, here am I. Send me. I'll do whatever I can. Send me. Do you and me, do we see the need? Can you see the need around us? Well, let's begin together before God in prayer, on our knees, before him, trusting him, begging him to work in the harvest. And making ourselves available. Look at the beginning of chapter 4. If we pray, God will send the laborers into the harvest. He keeps his prayer. And these laborers might just look very like you and I. Does that scare you? Is that a terrifying thought that that God might put his hand on your life and ask you to do something for him? Well, Jesus has already died for you. He's already given himself for you. What an honor to be asked by the king to work for him. Look at verse 1 of chapter 10. The people who Jesus sends into the harvest are the same people, men and women, the the same followers who were gathered around him, his followers, that he just told to pray, to send, to pray for God to send workers. Do you notice that? Pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send workers into the fields. And then he says, I want you twelve to go. These twelve aren't really Remarkable people. Not by this world's standards. They're not the ones who who we would immediately recruit and select to, 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 to staff a revolution that turned the world upside down. There's two of them, for example, in there. There's Matthew, who we, who we learned about last week, and there's Simon Zealot, who would quite happily have been at each other's throats because of their different politics. And yet in Christ, they're brothers who work together. There's fishermen. There's tax collectors. There's fishermen. There's, there's money men. There's, there's all of these different kinds of people. who are called by Jesus. Jesus specifically called these twelve. They forsook everything. They left their former lives and they followed Jesus. And by his power, not by their own power, they changed the world. And when they were called, they were first his disciples. A disciple is somebody who is, a, who is a student of a teacher, who follows a teacher, who is taught by a teacher, who lived for that teacher. There were many students under Jesus at that time, many people who were, who were, who were listening to his teachings. But Jesus called these twelve specifically for special service. And then verse 2, we're told they're apostles. Now, an apostle literally means a sent one, somebody who is sent. Jesus was sending these 12 out as his representatives, as his ambassadors, his first ambassadors, to proclaim his kingdom, that the kingdom of God was at hand to the Jewish people. Now, their role as disciples, as followers, wasn't unique. We believers, we share that with them today. We are disciples. We are followers. We are taught by him through the Holy Spirit. But their call as apostles was unique. Nobody else has shared that unique call since. 
Nobody else has seen Jesus and been sent by Jesus since. But the thing to notice, the thing to focus on, the thing to pay attention to here is that before they were sent, they were taught. Before they were apostles, they were disciples. Before they could go, they had to learn. Before Jesus sends somebody out to proclaim him and and, and to proclaim the kingdom, he calls them first to be his student, to sit at his feet, as it were, to learn about him, to learn of him, to learn from him, and to learn what it means to follow him, getting to know him. Simply being his disciple. So these twelve were learning and then were going. On this occasion, when Jesus sent them out, he sent them to a very specific field of service. He sent them out to minister minister strictly to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. (coughs) Now, the people of Israel, they may not have, have viewed themselves uh, that particular way, but 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 he, but Jesus, the shepherd, their king, even if they didn't accept him, their king, that's how he saw them. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that phrase, that term, that name that he gives them reminds me of what Jesus had just finished saying in, in chapter 9, that, that the, the multitudes, the people, the 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 Israelites who were around him and coming to him, that they were weary, that they were tired, that they were scattered like sheep having no shepherd. It's important to notice that it was to the Jewish people that the kingdom of God, the coming of the kingdom of God, was to be announced first. He was their promised king. The promise was to them first. So it was their promised kingdom that was at hand. They thought it would be a political, military kingdom that would come and that would overthrow and, and, and eject the Roman occupying forces from, from Judea. But no. This was Jesus' kingdom. A kingdom that has no end. A kingdom that lasts forever. A kingdom that is spiritual. A kingdom that is focused on the king and the lamb before the throne. The call is different for us in the 21st century. It's not specifically and only to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. The commission that Jesus has given to his people to us, is to go, therefore, and make disciples, make followers of all nations. It's a global commission. It's to anybody, everybody, anywhere, everywhere, including the Jewish people. They must not be left out. They are part of this great commission. And we long for the lost sheep of of the tribe of Israel to return. And they were sent with a message. Look at verses 7 and 8. They were sent with a message. This message was the same message that John the Baptist had preached. Look back at Matthew chapter 3 for that. And it was the same message that Jesus himself had preached. So they were carrying Jesus' message to the people. But they were to do it in a specific way. The proclamation of Jesus' kingdom was was to touch ordinary lives in a compassionate and personal way. They weren't weren't sent to judge. They weren't sent to condemn. They weren't sent to, to, to knock people down. They were sent to care for people. They were sent with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that gave them hope, that eased their burdens, that showed them that there was a way to forgiveness and a way to God. Just like Jesus had did. And they were sent 
remembering that Jesus had freely given them his grace and his mercy, and that that should act as the motivation for them freely giving of the good news of the gospel. It's the same motivation for us. We freely reserve, uh, uh, received God's grace and mercy when he saved us. So we too must freely give and forgive when we remember how God, how Jesus has treated us. He died for us. He poured out his blood for us. Not because we were good, but because we needed it. And he saw that need. We're not good people. Christians aren't good people telling bad people that they need to be better. No. No. We're forgiven people. Showing, telling, unforgiven people where forgiveness is freely available, where we found forgiveness to be freely available, and we're showing them where, we're showing everybody, anybody, where forgiveness, eternal forgiveness, is freely and powerfully available. That's our mission in this world. That's why we are still here. Lost and hurting people will, more, will be more ready to believe the gospel when we not only proclaim, the, proclaim it to them in Jesus' name, but when we minister to them in Jesus' power and we love them for Jesus' sake. We love them with the love of Christ that our hearts as his people are full of. The love of Christ compels us, constrains us to do this, forces us to do this. The love of Jesus that is shed abroad in our hearts, that's the fuel on which we run. That's the fuel that drives us into the fields for the harvest. These 12 disciples... They were a motley crew. But they were a motley crew with a mission. A powerful mission. And God's church, in all of our branches, is a motley crew. Just like these 12 apostles, these 12 disciples, these 12 followers of Jesus were. And Jesus is sending us into the harvest too, just like them. Let me ask you a question before, before I finish. What do you think? Or what's your understanding of what we're doing in church? Yes, we're worshipping, that's true. But what do you think is going on in church? when we're gathered together in one place. There was a Danish philosopher called Soren Kierkegaard. And I remember reading this about 40 years ago, and it took me ages to get my head around exactly what it was that he meant. But, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought that he was right. See, we think of church services like, like going to the theater or going to the movies or going to an event. And in church, the preacher, the one at the front, he, he's the actor, he's the performer. And, and the people sitting in the pews are, are the audience. And the audience, just like going to the movies and going to the theater, the audience can pass judgment on, on what the performer is doing, how good a performance it was, how, how, how bad a performance it was. They criticize what's going on in front of them. And that's what we do. That's what I've done. But that's so completely wrong. That's so completely missing the point the understanding of what is going on here. The preacher 
down at the front, he's not the actor. The minister, the, the, the one who is, who is pointing us to Christ, he's not the actor. He's merely the conductor in all of this. The prompter. That's my job as the prompter. And the congregation who sit and listen, they're not the audience. You're not the audience. You're the orchestra who goes and does and lives based on the Word of God and who takes the melody of the Word of God and sings it in the streets and in the highways and in the byways in such a way that you draw people to Christ. You are the orchestra. You're not the audience. Jesus is the audience. Jesus is the audience. He is the one whom we worship. Almighty God is the one whom we worship. And he is the one who sees. And for him we work. And in him we live and we move and we exist. So what will we do for Jesus? What will we do with this harvest? Well, together, let's pray. Let's get on our knees and pray. And don't stop praying until we know that God is blessing. Blessing where we are, blessing where you are. Blessing the souls and the lives of people around you. And let's be willing to go. If God touches us in our hearts and in our lives and gives us a burden to go and to do, even if it's just to talk to somebody. John Bunyan, who famously wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, he was, he was saved when he overheard two women gossiping about the gospel, talking about the good news of Jesus Christ to one another. That's how powerful, how powerful God's word is. The harvest is ripe. Pray God to send laborers into the harvest. We are the laborers that he has here in Easter Ross, in Scotland, in the world. Let's pray and let's go. Amen. Heavenly Father, through your word compel us to be willing servants, instruments in the Redeemer's hand, that we may lay up treasures in heaven, that we may compel men and women and boys and girls to turn to Jesus and to see Jesus and to wish that he was there and to come to him. Lord, as the shepherd of our souls, that you would be the shepherd of all souls in this place, in this area, and that we would see you at work. For Jesus' sake, amen. Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our Captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand again. It's the devil's lies An army bold Whose battle cry is love Reaching out to those in darkness Our call to war To love the captive soul but to rage against the captor And with the sword that makes the wounded whole We will fight with faith and valor When faced with trials on every side We know the outcome is secure And Christ will have the price for which he died An inheritance of nations Come 
see the cross where love and mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen and as the stone is rolled away and Christ emerges from the grave this victory march continues to the day every eye and heart shall see him So Spirit come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful, as saints of old still line the way. Retelling triumphs of His grace We hear their calls And hunger for the day When with Christ we'll stand in glory Well, just one or two announcements to make before we conclude with a benediction. Our service this evening at 5.30 will be in the Capstan Centre in Allness. It's a face-to-face in-person service, but will also be available uh, on our YouTube channel um, from 5.30. Please do join us if you can. Our prayer meetings through the week at early morning meetings on Tuesday and Thursday at 7.30 a.m., exclusively on Zoom. Wednesday evening, 7.30 p.m. is both in person, face-to-face, and on Zoom. It will be from the Capstan Centre Auditorium in Illness. If you want to join on Zoom, please do get in touch, and uh, we'll make the Zoom details available to you. Thursday evening, um, we have our men's meeting, our monthly men's meeting, Tuesday, uh, Thursday the 29th at 7.30, when we continue our study of uh, Joe Barnard's book together. Please do join us for that. Road to Recovery, um, Tuesday evening, 7.30. Uh, please pray for the work of Road to Recovery. Um, support what it's doing and, and, and how it's meeting the needs of people uh, here in this part of the world. Our services next Sunday morning, 11 a.m., the Reverend John Wilson will lead us in that service. And uh, on Sunday evening at 5.30, the service will be led by Callum McMillan, the Reverend Callum McMillan, who will be returning from his holiday. We look forward to that. All these things are, of course, God willing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen.